Thank you. Uh, yes, I am Christina Marquardt. I am working as a researcher here at the Department of Urban and Rural Development. I have a background as an agronomist and I have a PhD in rural development. And I'm here not so much as a cocoa expert, but as a person that have worked in um, rural context where cocoa is produced. And I will talk about processes of change in rural areas where cocoa can be seen as part of uh, driving the change, but also as a consequence of changes happening. I'm not sure how, what, how I move here. <laughs> uh, okay, can I point with this also? Yes, but t take into consideration that people that is watching on stream will not see the point. Okay. So you have to describe it. Mm -hmm. So I will talk uh, a little bit out from my current project uh, where we look at forest driven climate, uh, climate mitigation change programs in relation to farming systems and the o the, that the intertwined processes of forest change and uh, forest transition and agrarian change. And with that I mean the process when forests boundaries of forest frontiers are withdrawing and agriculture frontiers are moving into the, th that areas that used to be forest land and the whole proce process of intensification of farming in these areas. It could be new crops, new varieties, new techniques, new inputs and also agro-business, commercial agriculture moving into these areas. And also the framing of the state in these areas that uh, m um, drive politics for modernization of um, rural areas. And then we have worked in two areas that we'll talk about two cases, San Martin in Peru and Pará in Brazil. And though these are two places where co uh, cocoa is booming as crops. And there are also areas that go through dramatic peri periods of change and where cocoa can be seen as uh, partly driving a little bit of the change, but also be a consequence uh, of uh, the, the booming can be seen as a consequence of all the changes happening. So just to situate you where uh, Pará and San Martín are placed, if I managed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which one is the pinpointer? Uh, okay. Uh, San Martin is based around here, just on the other side of the Andes, uh, on the eastern side of the Andes. And uh, so it's where the Andes and the Amazon meet. So it's a very hilly area. And Pará is around Belém around here somewhere, Santarem, here, uh, which is a much more flatter area. So it's the two extremes of the Amazon we have been working. Uh, whoops. Sorry. <laughs> Should I direct it somewhere else? So, yeah. And all these farmers, uh, in both cases, they are Sweden farmers as most farmers are in the Amazon. That means that they open up the fields in forest, they cut down the forest or the vegetation, uh, they burn the material they have cut down and then they sow their products and then they do what they do most, they weed. That's the highest, that's the most labor intensive work on these farms. And it, in many cases it's done manual with machete or in some cases they might be used herbicides. And you farm for a couple of years and when the production goes down, you leave the field and it's regenerated into forest again or some kind of vegetation at least, and you start farming a new field. But if you plant cocoa, that cycle is of course stopped because cocoa is a, permanent, a, per a perennial crop and a permanent field. So that kind of change uh, the whole system. And depending how much land you have, it's more or less complicated to have a permanent field in a rotative farming system.
<laughs> I feel a little bit stupid here. Point over that one. No. How hard can it be? So hard. So, so there are these two cases then. We will start talk about San Martin, Lamas. And as you see, this is an area that's quite peeled from forest today. It's an area which 40 or 50 years ago was intact forest. Uh, and it started with loggers coming in, taking out the most valuable timbers, uh, constructing roads, take out the timbers, and people start to move in. First in a slowly pace, but then in an explosive manner. And today, this is the area of Peru that has the highest deforestation rate. Uh, and as you will see, uh, if we look a little bit on the... So, if you just look a little bit on these statistics, one can see how the forest boundaries have unsettled. In the 80s, 90s, if you the, the top uh, graph, you can see how people start to move in in massive scale in the 80s, 90s. And that was a period when forest, uh, people migrated from the Andean areas where people had very little land, the very small farms, low productive farms, and they moved in hope to find new uh, farmland. And they were also promoted by the government. There were programs to move into the Amazon, and they were promoted with, with uh, the, to work with certain crops, such as maize, cotton, rice, and um, there were credits applied, etc., etc. Uh, and the second uh, graph you see here is the deforestation rate, because people they moved away from they moved away from the Andes into the Amazon. In development studies, we talk and push and pull factors. There are things that push away people to move away from something, and there are pull factors that make them move to something. So they moved away from the difficult situation in the Andes into the Amazon, where they hoped to get uh, f uh, farmland. But there were also other pull factors, such as coca production, because in this period, the 80s, 90s, the coca production moved from into Peru, and, so, and suddenly there was a crop that actually paid quite well for par farmers. Uh, and that was a pull factor for people to start to move in. But this coca production was facilitated by two guerrilla groups in the area, and all this became a quite violent cocktail with also the Peruvian military involved in this. So during a period, there was a civil war in this area. And you can see, if you look at the deforestation uh, numbers, they're quite low, but as the civil war ends and things become calmer in the area, the deforestation skyrockets. And this is also the period when Peru decentralized. Uh, um, regional governments got the responsibility and the opportunity to decide over f forest resources in the regions and also start to, to um, promote their own agriculture development politics. So the regional government in, Peru in San Martin, they started to promote what they call hub crops, and one of those is cocoa. So that kind of exploded after in this period. You see, as the deforestation explodes, also these crops uh, that you see in the bottom graph here uh, increase rapidly. And the hub crops, crops that they promote are perennial crops, such as coffee, cocoa, and lately palm oil that is expanded is increasing rapidly. The number you see to the left is the hec number of hectares um, harvested at the moment, but the, the 24,712 is what is planted. So this is a crop that expands extremely fast in this area. Um, and also after this coca production, cocoa and coffee also was crops that was promoted as anti-drugs Pro, uh, crops. There were whole programs promoting that farmers should uh, start to grow coffee and cocoa instead of coca. 
and the whole idea was to have a permanent crop would, would stop farms from expand. That will establish the crop uh, and the farm, and that will make people not advance further into the, to the forest areas. But in reality, what it happened was that it became a pull factor. More people moved into the area, hoping for the opportunities to grow cocoa and coffee. And actually, the forest fronter have continued to withdraw, and the deforestation have continued. So, uh, this, uh, in, so in, the, in the whole this very complex situation, the farmers then try to make their living and they are planting cocoa and other crops. And you can see in this area, you can see three groups of farmers. You can see indigenous farmers, such as uh, Vildoro's family here down to the right. He's a Quechua Lamista uh, farmer. There are also Mestizo farmers that have lived in this area maybe the last century, and there are these newly migrated Andean fa uh, farmers. And they have different agriculture knowledge. They all work with cocoa, but in slightly different ways. And they also, uh, many of them combine the cocoa farming with food cropping. Uh, particularly the, the Quechua Lamista farmers, they have quite a lot of their subsistence farmers farming still uh, very active. This is an area that is very rich in agrobiodiversity and, and uh, depending, there is a big span among uh, farmers and groups, but most farmers keep a certain part of their fields for food cropping. And of course, depends how much land you have. Many farms are very small, 80% of all the farmers in the Peruvian Amazon have less than 10 hectares, and 60% have less than 5 hectares. So to maintain this rot rotative agriculture of Sweden farmer farming on 5 hectares, and then set off fields for permanent agriculture, is very complicated for many farmers. So those with the smallest amount of land have, very, have less possibilities, of course, to, to put up, uh, to start a permanent field, because you have to wait several years before it starts to produce, and you might not be able to, to have enough incomes while you're waiting for the field to produce. So, so but that makes most co cocoa fields that you find out in the field, they are integrated with food production. Uh, as you see, this top... Uh, Top photo, you hardly don't see the cocoa, uh, the cocoa uh, plants, but they're in here and they are mixed with all kinds of different trees. And these are not random trees, these are trees that are, have a purpose. There are construction trees, there are fruit trees, there are trees for selling, uh, fi uh, 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 firewood, this is roof palms for roof construction. So, what the farmers do, they do small uh, nurseries with small seedlings, and then they start to transplant them out in their food product producing field. And slowly, the, uh, the cocoa canopy will close, and there will be less and less food products in, the, in their field. And then the farmers will open a new field to, do, to plant more food products. So the idea that the farm will stop expanding into forest land just because they establish, establish a cocoa uh, field uh, is an assumption that don't, it doesn't really hold. Uh, yes. And the challenges around this, what's happened with this cocoa production that have expanded extremely fast is that, that it has been done with very limited plant material. The farmers, they graft, they have a robust local variety as the mother stem, and then they graft an improved cocoa variety on that mother stem. And uh, there had been very few varieties used for that. So what's happening is, of course, that sooner or later it comes a disease or pests that strikes into these plantations. And in this is a photo from the coffee production that follow a similar pattern in 2014, the coffee leaf rust 
wiped out almost 50% of all the coffee production in this area. In 2015, a similar process is starting with, um, within the cocoa production. It is the, let's see if I remember the name of it, frosty rot, rot pod disease. I don't know what that is, but you, I'm sure you know <laughs> what that disease is. Yeah. Uh, wiping up large part of the, the production. Of course, uh, for the individual family, that is a big catastrophe because this is the major income they have. Also with very small farm sizes, uh, to do rota rotative agriculture on five hectares or less is very hard and you soon run into problem of land degradation and this kind of very aggressive weed that grows quickly in degraded land, it's, it's, it's spreading out all over San Martin. And this is, in these farmers, they hardly use any fertilizer, they don't have any animals, they're no man manure to use. So the only way they normally regenerate their fields is through f forest fallows. So if you don't have enough land to do forest fallowing a certain period, you run into big problems and that's, it's something that can be seen. Uh, uh, quite commonly. There was a big tenure uh, conflicts in the area. It's these Andean farmers moving into areas which used to be indigenous areas or mestizo areas and there are conflicts about land. Also the regional government has so, uh, made projects of zonification of the area where they have decided that 70% 7 of the land of San Martin should be protected areas but there are already people living in those areas, producing in these areas. So in many cases, farmland overlap with these lands that are supposed to be protected areas. So there are disputes and, and conflicts around who really have the rights to the land. And of course, there are also problems on transport. Many of these villages are located in areas where you can only reach walking or with horses, and it's hard for the farmers to take out the products for selling, but also to take in inputs into their farms. And then looking on the other side of the Amazon in the Anapu, this is area which the Brazil Brazilian government opened up uh, for migration in the 70s as a way to solve the highly unequal land distribution situation in Brazil and people moved in and they were giving 100 hectare plots where they were supposed to farm only 20 hectares of those and leave the other 80% intact. However, that really didn't really happen. And also the state pulled out quite quickly and left people out here with a continuous, migration, a continuous process of migration, people moving in, high turnover of, of um, Peop uh, of land ownership, and cause, which created a situation with very opportunistic land use. The people quickly draw out the most valuable timbers, um, creating grazing um, uh, pastures for grazing, and also today the big crop here is um, um, cocoa. Let's see if I have the next. So the settlers here, in difference to San Martin, are settlers that came in the 80s, 90s, and they have come from the northeastern part, main, most of them from the northeastern part of Brazil, which is a very dry area. So they come with totally other ag agriculture knowledge than what you would need in the Amazon. Uh, and they don't, they, in difference, in, in Peru, most, in the Peruvian case, most farmers would also be quite not, not, not I can say it <laughs> quite, uh, they have a good knowledge of how to use the forest also. These farmers have quite little experience and knowledge about how to use the forest. So they mainly, they mainly farm, they don't use the forest more than logging it. And uh, the big crop here is cocoa. Oh, though there are large areas that have very bad soil quality, it's not very apt for cocoa production and they have areas with quite low productivity. Uh, other staple crops in this area is acai and uh, cassava, which are staple crop, regional staple crop, but maybe not so big in the 
export market. So these farmers, they do as the Peruvian farmers, they burn a piece of land, they plant their cocoa, uh, more in a monocrop, not such so integrated as the Peruvian uh, farmers, and uh, they plant some shade uh, trees, and they are much more elaborated in how they ferment this fermenting process. Uh, however, we, we visited one farmer there that is... The, oh, no, I was too quick. Don Ronaldo, and he was a man that experimented with his cocoa farming. He wanted to... He was part... He was organic certified. He was part of an organic cooperative. He was also part of environmental payment schemes. And he had started to... Instead of burning uh, the forest and plant the cocoa and then plant shading trees, he had started to thin out the forest and plant the cocoa plants within this, uh, uh, this original forest. However, such a work takes more, three, it's three times more work for him to do such an environmental better plantation than to burn and start to, pl to plant from zero. He argued that that was worth it because he had a, he could see a long, in long-term perspective, he would have a better soil fertility uh, situation because they're quite poor soils. But he could afford to do this long-term investment because he had 50 hectares of land, he had grazing areas he could rent out, uh, and he had some fields that were in production. And that's... Um, uh, not all farmers could afford to do such a long, long term investment. And he, he was far, part of this cooperative and he was... Uh, I mean, he, he was very positive about, about the organic certification, but he also saw a lot of challenges with it. And one thing was the bureaucracy around it that was hard for them to handle. If, if you had a conventional cocoa bean, you can go and sell it to anyone and you get paid directly and you're, it's finished. But for, at least in their production, they had to keep up the documentation, they have to sell them to a certain person and they got only paid when the cocoa was sold in Europe. So it's quite a time lag when they had to uh, lay out money, which was problematic for them. And maybe the largest problem for the farmers in this area is the is the, this water dam, this hydroelectric water dam that is constructed, is one of the largest in the world, and it's uh, uh, thousands of people moving in to work there, and that makes all labor prices going up. So at the moment, they can't. Many of the cocoa farmers cannot employ people to harvest cocoa for them, and many cocoa farmers then just leave their crop and go and work on the dam construction themselves. And after, when this construction is finished, all these workers will probably also s stay and search for land in this area, which will further put pressure on this uh, forest land in this area. Uh, there's also issues of illegal logging in this area. As the state is not very strong in this area, what those who maintain some services to, to this farmers are actually illeg illegal loggers. They construct the roads to them. So even if farmers don't sympathize with these loggers, they have to negotiate with them. They have to have some kind of relation with them because they provide s those services that normally the state will do, construct roads and sometimes schools. And it's also connected with a great deal of risk to go against them. This... Uh, uh, grave here, or this um, um, this um, cruise, is where the 73-year-old Catholic nun Dorothy Stang was shot by uh, the illegal illegal loggers and also the power elite of the areas because she tried to set up uh, smallholder settlements that would be like a protection between the agriculture area and the forest areas. There are also large-scale uh, cattle rangers in the area that burn their fields to get better grass each year, and sometimes these uh, fires become uncontrollable, and they escape and 
then spread into other people's, other farmers' land and destroy cocoa fields and other fields. So just trying to tie up this a little bit, it's, it's a very complex reality these farmers try to navig navigate through when they try to produce cocoa and other cash crops and their own food crops. And it's full of a lot of contradictions. There are very many different interests, agendas among actors that are dilemma, frictions and trade-offs between land use interests, but also between uh, ecological and social interests. And there are great deal, the important issues of politics and powers that we cannot overlook or ignore when we talk about agriculture, forestry and land use. And it can seem overwhelming with all the complexity, maybe, but if we want to contribute to a better livelihood to, those, to the rural areas through certification processes or environmental schemes, we have to unpack this complex, these complexities and we have to understand these contextual specific um, processes of change, the historical, ecological, social, political and economic processes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Uh, a very deep and messy situation she is, going, she is presenting to us just to try to grasp the complexity of these processes. And every time we try to intervene and try to make an influence, both as a policy makers, consumers or researchers, uh, Christina, I have a question about uh, something you mentioned uh, about land property. It is said that, at least in the case of sub-Saharan Africa and the countries that are cocoa producers, around 80% of women are the producers, but less than 15% of them own the land, which pose a big challenge, a problem to get access to the certification, which demands you to have ownership on the land. Have you seen similar patterns in the, in the two countries you have been studying in Latin America? Um, so I have not particularly worked with certification, so I cannot, I cannot really answer that question. But uh, in general, the situation is in Latin America is quite different from Africa, where men and women normally owns the land together in a, to a larger degree, and there are more uh, but there's also many of these farmers, they don't ever have papers on their, on their land, so they are in no position to claim their land if somebody else come and, and uh, dispute, which is, for example, happening in San Martin, where there is this process of uh, uh, forest protection processes when the government is, is, is claiming areas where people actually are living. Thank you. Questions for the audience. We have around five minutes to make questions to Christina. Please, raise your hands. No more questions? No? Nope. Yes? Uh, I missed the, the first presentation. I missed the very beginning of your presentation as well, so I don't know if you've covered anything on this, but have you in your studies done anything about the fair trade? Or are any of these farmers fair trade certified? Uh, no, uh, our research is mainly about this larger processes of change that affects, uh, of course, these farmers. And it's also this very complex context where this fair trade certification or the, uh, your certification has to fit in. And uh, all the, the, the unin, I mean, the, Many of these uh, certification or environmental projects, they become, they are master plan that are planned to work in a larger scale, but then when it's implemented in a local context, it has a lot of unexpected consequences, and that also goes for far, fair trade. It, is, it doesn't play out often as it was thought. And I think, it, I mean, you mentioned that. It, it's, it doesn't have the impact that it was thought to have. And from my perspective, I think one of the things we, if we want to have an impact, we have to um, 
adapt them and to the, the local context much more, and we have to uh, embrace the variability and the diversity in the way we design such uh, incentives, rather than smoothing it out, because that's what we researcher normally wants to do. We, we want to make <laughs> Uh, the picture a little bit uh, more easy to understand. Thank you. More questions from the audience? Yeah, it's again one of these uh, maybe a bit weird certification questions and you said you're not, you're not an expert on this. Um, so if, if you cannot answer this, it's no problem at all. Um, the, but with certification strategies at the moment, there is quite a push to, towards the landscape approach. Um, and I was just wondering, you, I mean, you, you talk more about the overall picture. So, so what do you think could be an, you know, an approach to, to integrate landscapes more into certification processes to actually um, capture that broader picture? What we are trying to do in our research is uh, exactly what you're saying a little bit, to try to look at the landscape rather than to divide, for example, forestry, to separate forestry from agriculture. Maybe there are ways to certify landscape, whether you look at agri agriculture and uh, uh, forestry together in some way, and what are the, uh, the ecosystem services that can be used from forestry into agriculture, for example. Also to look at how subsistence uh, farming could be used, could be combined with cash crop maybe in systems that you certify, to look at the whole farm rather than only look at certain crops. I th could be ways forward. Mm. Thank you so much, Christina. Please a round of applause for her and her presentations. <laughs>